Welcome to the Blue Security Podcast, a weekly podcast for information security defenders, where we bring you discussions on best practices, tools, and implementation for enterprise security. Now, here are your hosts for today's show, Andy Ja and Adam Brewer. Welcome to this week's episode of the Blue Security Podcast. I'm Andy, your host. I am Adam, your co-host. If you are on Twitter, InfoSec Twitter, or IT Twitter, Tech Twitter, you may have seen that there was a lot of talk about Cloudflare this week. I started noticing it when one of the folks that I follow changed their name to something like Drop Kiwi Farms or Cloudflare Supports Hate, uh, Cloudflare, you know, Drop Cloudflare. There were a lot of different hashtags and a lot of trending topics related to Cloudflare. And I wanted to talk through that tonight. If you were unaware about what happened, we're going to talk about it and then kind of give our thoughts on it because I think it is important as part of our industry not to only understand what happened, but some of the implications maybe going forward uh, due to the actions of Cloudflare. So how did this really start? There's a lot of backstory, and so I'm going to try to go through it um, because you may not be aware. But there was a person named Clara Sorrenti, a popular Twitch streamer who is also known as Keffels on Twitch. She streams games while she comments on news and politics. She's also transgender, and she uses her platform to speak out against the growing anti-LGBTQ movement in the U.S., on August 5th, she was doxxed, and she woke up to armed police officers with riot shields and assault rifles pointed at her. She lives in London, Ontario. If you're not aware of what doxing is, it is basically when people kind of research and look up your personal information, like your phone number or your address, and then they publish it to the public to say, hey, this is where this person lives, or this is what their phone number is going harass them essentially. And so she claims that someone sent an email impersonating her to everyone in the city council stating that she had an illegal firearm, which is illegal in the, in Canada, if you don't have it for a specific purpose and that she had killed her mother and was planning on shooting every cisgender person at city hall. The police took this very seriously and took it as a legitimate threat. And obviously what, and arrested her and confiscated all of her streaming equipment as well as her partners. And obviously that that's very, um, it's very concerning. Um, and when you do this, when you call in like a false report like this, it's a form of online bullying called swatting. And that's when someone calls up or emails or something, a threat to the police, posing it to that person or as a concerned citizen, and then they send the police to that person's address saying they may be selling drugs or have a gun or want to hurt their family. And it's extremely dangerous for most people, but even more for like persons of color, you know, where accidental deaths have happened before due to swatting. And so these are both forms of online bullying, um, things that you know, your personal privacy can be violated. So all of this was attributed to users of an online forum called Kiwi Farms, which was founded by a former 8chan admin. And if you know 8chan, it was also a really terrible underground online forum. And it was founded in 2013, so it's been around for almost 10 years. Well known for stalking, swatting, harassing, doxing, intimidating people. The site's been connected to the suicides of at least three people who were targets of sustained harassment. So basically, the worst of the worst on the internet. 8chan, of course, was a spinoff of 4chan, which was a spinoff of the Something Awful forums. And I was a very active participant on the Something Awful forums back in the day. Uh, love them, especially at the time, what was interesting about them was it cost $10 to register an account, which isn't an enormous sum of money, but it does help keep 
you know, some of the, the most low value content off the forums. And the, the thing I always like to point out is when people like give that, that lineage, that family tree, were there people associated with something awful that were really bad people? Yes. Especially the, um, the now recently deceased, uh, low tax, uh, had, had turned out to be, uh, the, who was the site's founder, um, a pretty awful person, which is really not relevant to this discussion. Um, however, you know, he's kind of bought out of the site and, and really no longer considered welcome in the community. And, and something awful also, I would just say had really strong moderation in the sense that, um, you could be banned for not following any set of number of rules. And there were a lot of rules. And if you didn't follow them, you got banned, um, compared to any other forum on the internet, like most people don't understand the the strict level of moderation that occurred there and doing things like launching a denial of service attack on another site was strictly forbidden and would get you banned and doxing someone would get you banned and any number of really bad behavior. So it, it's interesting to point out when people give that family tree, the people who went and founded like 4chan and 8chan, they're the people that got kicked off something awful for being jerks. And so that's where it came from is, is the people who, we're trying to maintain moderation, you know, kick them out. And then those people went and formed their new club and they were all jerks together and, and it kind of grew from there. So I am not at all surprised to hear that this is the latest offshoot of those communities. Um, disappointed that they're still around and still doing awful stuff, but moderation is going to be a topic that we're going to discuss tonight on the show. And so I, I thought it was somewhat ironic to mention that, Whenever you hear that that family tree of sites and and the origin story is always around something awful, something awful was actually really strongly moderated. So just a little background for anyone who cares or is interested about where these communities, you know, originally sprung up. So Sorrenti, she left her home and went to a local hotel after she was doxxed because they knew where she lived. On August 17th, which was uh, about a week or so later, almost two weeks, she posted a picture of her fiance's cat on the hotel bed. She thought it was now kind of safe to at least do things and kind of tell people that she was safe. The people harassing her spent hours looking at the bed sheets and cross-referencing them with every hotel in her city until they found a match. And when they did, they sent pizzas from five different companies to her hotel room. And so, it's not as bad sending pizzas, obviously, than doing a swatting attempt and sending the police because now that the police are aware that she was the victim of this, they're not going to respond in the same way. But it is still a real world threat that they're sending her, telling her that they know where she's staying and they're willing to act on it in the real world. So she moved hotels after that and tried to do some misinformation saying that she was staying at an Airbnb, but then her Uber account was hacked and they found the location of the new hotel and she was sent hundreds of dollars worth of food from her Uber account. So, you know, continually getting harassed and then strangers started sending automated um, and threatening voicemails to her family um, and her friends. So she left the country and took some refuge in Belfast, Ireland. Once she was in Ireland, she was doxxed again. And a person posted a photo of a message that contained the date and a reference to Kiwi Farm, specifically outside of her temporary residence. You know, so, this is just, it, it, I remember the, the 1995 Sandra Bullock movie, The Net, with the Praetorians and everything, the little pie symbol in the corner of the screen. And, and part of it was like, your entire life is online. You know, they can track you anywhere. And I, I remember watching it as somebody who was, had at least a functional understanding of the internet and thinking like, this is so far-fetched, you know? And it's like crazy as you tell this story, Andy, and you tell the facts of what happened, how because she is so used to living her life online and sharing information and sharing her location and all that, all of that can be used against her. Like something as benign as the bedspread at a hotel, you know, you could go look that up, go look at Yelp reviews, go look at 
travel advisor pictures and whatever trip advisor um, and try to figure it out. And that's incredible. I mean, it really does remind you of that. Like everywhere Sandra Bullock went in that movie, you know, she, she, no one was safe and like going to another country and having a message outside her door. That's, it's unreal stuff. Like, yes, if your Uber gets hacked, then they can break into that and see your location, see where you've been, see where you've been going. It's, it's, it is really scary. And, you, you know, we, we sometimes infosec professionals get accused of like always assuming the worst or planning for the worst or assuming negative intent. And for most of us, we won't ever experience something like this. Um, especially those of us who are cisgender, who are straight, you know, who are white, um, we're much less likely to, to face some of these threats. And I recognize my privilege in that. Um, but at the same time, this is where being not paranoid, but cautious is important because if you take those steps now, you can hopefully prevent some of this. And some of this isn't preventable because it's just very determined attackers, right? Like the bedspread thing is like, you literally just can't post pictures. You just can't at all. Um, the Uber thing maybe could have been mitigated with multi-factor authentication. Who knows, right? We don't know the details. It's just, again, it's crazy that what was far-fetched Hollywood film only 27 years ago is now reality. That's really crazy to think about. So on August 23rd, she started a campaign for Cloudflare to drop Kiwi Farms as a customer. So a little bit of background on Cloudflare. Cloudflare was protecting Kiwi Farms. And historically, Cloudflare has been reluctant to drop customers in general of questionable content, moral content. Um, they were reluctant to drop neo-Nazi sites like the Daily Stormer, um, ignoring pressure from critics and claiming neutrality. And it wasn't until 2017 that Cloudflare acted against the extremist site um, after the death of Heather Heyer in Charlottesville, Virginia, after that one rally. And in 2019, in the wake of shootings in El Paso, te Texas, the company booted 8chan, where the site frequented. And then it took more than a single violent instance to get a response um, because 8chan was also responsible for the terrorist attack on the two mosques in Christchurch, New Zealand. And so Cloudflare has had a history of protecting extremist sites and really only dropping them after the worst has happened. Why is Cloudflare important in this? Most notably, I would say this site wouldn't exist without Cloudflare. And that's for a a couple of different reasons. And for most people who are casual surfers of the web, they may not even be aware of Cloudflare, but understandably people who are listening to the show who are in IT, who are in InfoSec have heard of Cloudflare and understand what they do. They're a CDN. They're also a security company. Um, and so because they're a CDN, they make Kiwi farms faster and easier to use by generating thousands of copies of the site or caching it and storing it at endpoints around the world where then users can quickly access it. So if it's easy to use, people are going to use it more often. They also protect Kiwi farms from DDoS attacks, which most undoubtedly this site would, you know, have people would launch DDoS attacks against the site to bring it down because they're trying to, you know, not have it on the internet and Cloudflare protects against that. And they're one of the best in the industry at protecting against DDoS attacks. They also hide the identity of the web hosting company, which prevents people from pressuring the hosting provider from taking any action against it. Cloudflare and this whole thing, what their argument is, is that they're like a pipeline. They're a utility. They just serve the infrastructure. They're not actually hosting the content, but because they're in front of the hosting provider, no one can actually see who the provider is and kind of, pressure them to take that content down. So it's it's like they think they're the water pipeline and what you do with the water, it's up to you, right? Like you do whatever, I'm just delivering it to you. So that's their whole argument. And 
on 831 or August 31st of this year, the CEO of Cloudflare, Matthew Prince, and the head of public policy, Alyssa Starzak, published a blog title, Cloudflare's Abuse Policies and Approach. And if you read through this, you'll see that they basically double down on their stance and ignore, again, the criticism of what everyone's trying to say. They say, giving everyone the ability to sign up for our services online also reflects our view that cyber attacks not only should not be used for silencing vulnerable groups, but are not the appropriate mechanism for addressing problematic content online. We believe cyber attacks in any form should be relegated to the dustbins of history. There was no mention of Kiwi Farms in the post. And they also say that some argue that we should terminate these services to content we find reprehensible so that others can launch attacks and knock it offline. This is the equivalent argument in the physical world that a fire department shouldn't respond to fires in homes of people who do not possess sufficient moral character, both in the physical world and online. That's a dangerous precedent and one that is over the long term most likely to disproportionately harm vulnerable and marginalized communities. Now, I find that last one kind of interesting because there's a little bit of truth in that. Like if you think about the fire department example, for sure, if there's a fire, it shouldn't matter who's living there, you're responding to the fire. And I think most of us have seen medical dramas where, you know, the, the criminal comes in and the doctor has to perform medical treatments on the criminal. It doesn't matter what crime they've committed. The doctor is, you know, has the Hippocratic Oath and is a doctor sworn to protect life. And so they're going to do what they need to do as the doctor. Um, but I also think some of that logic is fault, uh, faulty, in, in my opinion, because they're, they're not a public utility. They're, they don't have a Hippocratic Oath to protect life. They're not funded by tax dollars. You know, they're a publicly traded company that has shareholders to report to. And so, you know, th- that's not what doctors are held accountable to. That's not what fire departments are held accountable to. And so I, I just think that there is a little bit of truth, but they can't stand by that principle because they're not really, you know, the same as a fire department or in this, my example, a doctor. So I find all this discussion interesting and actually Second, something awful reference of the night. I remember in the early 2000s when Google, especially like early 2000s, like up to 2004 when Google launched Gmail in like 2005. Like if you remember when Gmail came out, it was light years ahead of everything else out there. Light years ahead of Yahoo Mail and Hotmail, which are probably the two most popular free email services at the time. Gmail gave you a full gigabyte of storage. And no intrusive ads, just inline ads that were targeted to your use, as opposed to like 220 meg of email storage and very obtrusive, obnoxious banner ads and pop ups and pop unders and pop overs and all that garbage that was especially prevalent at that time on the incumbent providers of the day. And, you know, Google search was super good and, and the Google homepage was super clean. It was just the Google logo and a search box. You know, and even the ads in search were not obtrusive. Then they were clearly marked. And they launched a service at this time, like around 2003, 2004, 2005 timeframe, somewhere in there. And it was some sort of like web web accelerator. And as it turned out, like it wasn't fully baked. And so you could potentially see content that was intended for another user. The idea was everything would flow through some sort of like proprietary Google proxy and it would like recompress it and send it to you. And it really didn't speed things up. But again, you started seeing web pages that weren't intended for you. And it was the first time to me that I ever saw somebody talk about Google in a negative light and point out 
that Google may not be your friend. You know, Google, despite the, especially at the time, you know, the company uh, mission to do no evil, you know, don't be evil, um, turns out was kind of evil sometimes and would do things that weren't so great. And, and that story, it was just starting to bubble up. And it was actually, again, on the something awful forums where people pointed that out for the first time. And I think Cloudflare in the technical space has enjoyed a groundswell of goodwill for a very long time and has not really been questioned as far as their motives and how they make their decisions and everything else. Because Cloudflare, for those of you that may not know or may not remember this, launched a public DNS offering that was extremely popular and was supposed to be faster and better than like Google DNS. So if everyone knows like Google DNS 8.8.8.8, um, Cloudflare is 1.1.1.1 and they launched it. And actually I believe I have it configured on my router today. I think it's the one I use um, as opposed to your ISP because it does give you a, a little bit more privacy if you're not using your ISP's DNS lookup because they actually use that to track you and stuff. Anyhow, Cloudflare got so much goodwill from that. Oh, this is great. Cloudflare, they've got this public DNS. It's super fast and it's private and it's great. And and Cloudflare, they, you know, they stop the bad guys. They stop DDoS attacks. They do this, they do that. And it's just yet another reminder that like, you know, for-profit companies, capitalists will operate in their own best interests at the end of the day. And I think, Andy, you're you're about to get to this point on here, so I'll just make it. Um in, in the rundown, you know, in that statement that Andy read from Cloudflare, they talked about how cyber tech should be relegated to the dustbin of history. And it turns out that Cloudflare actually has provided like anti DDoS protection uh, for a guy who ran DDoS software like DDoS for hire um, and, and was actually convicted a couple of years ago. And he points out that like Cloudflare profits from the existence of DDoS for higher schemes because then they can protect against it. I mean, that's mafioso stuff right there. Literally, that's the mafia coming in, knocking on your door, your restaurant and saying, hey, nice restaurant. Be shame if anything were to happen to it. You know, we'll offer you protection for a cut of the profits. Like who's going to do anything to my restaurant? The mob is if you don't pay them protection. And here's Cloudflare like we're going to. Uh, help protect people who run a DDoS for hire business because then people need more of our product. Like that's, that's straight up mafioso and that's not, not great. So I, I think from the perspective of the moderation subject and moderation is a huge subject in so much discourse today about internet services. You've heard a lot about section 230, section 230, section 230, you know, it's the GOP's favorite uh, bit of legislation they love to talk about. Um, the question always comes like, should there be more moderation or should there be less moderation in certain services? And Cloudflare's position here, and we can argue whether it's the right position, but the position they've clearly staked out is they don't want to be involved in moderation. They want to act more like a independent peddler of goods, you know, and that we're not going to judge you one way or the other. That all sounds good, but that has consistently over the history of the internet fallen down because there are plenty of other stakeholders in the food chain who have requirements for moderation. You will run into someone who says, yes, this must be moderated or we won't do business with them. As an example, did you know that in order to have your app in Google Play or the App Store, the Apple App Store, you must moderate whatever service underlies it? If you don't provide sufficient moderation, that is grounds for being terminated from Google Play or the App Store. And recently enough, as it turns out, Google has been enforcing this more strongly than Apple has. You know, Apple has this history of being like this Disney like company that has a very, um, very tight standards for content. And yet Google has been more strictly enforcing this lately. So, you know, there could be downstream impacts eventually, whereas Cloudflare works with Apple and Google in some ways and, and has some crossover with them because of how strictly they moderate their respective app stores. And because they have a requirement for content moderation and not allowing unacceptable content, 
you know, that's, that's a interesting challenge that Cloudflare could run into. Yeah. And it's interesting that you mention uh, the GOP in section 230 because Cloudflare in their final post, I think it was either they made two posts, which we'll get to the final one. But uh, in one of them, they mentioned how they believe that content moderation should be legislated. And I strongly disagree with that. I would rather, I mean, we live in America, we have freedoms and we, you know, we have capitalism. And so I think people should vote with their wallets and with their opinions that way. Content moderation should be done through these private companies on what their terms and conditions are for using the platform and not what the government should be telling us. You know, like I, I don't think uh, the government should be putting grounds and, and legislating moderation into law because that that doesn't sit right with me, at least in my opinion. Um, I don't know what and, you think. And about more that. likely, in in the current political environment, Andy, it would be anti-moderation legislation. Would be more likely is what would pass is prohibiting certain kinds of moderation. Um, and I think that is is equally dangerous. It's um. It's one of those things where, hey, if you're truly a capitalist, then build build a better social network, build a better this, build a better that, build the next thing if you want to be able to do your own content moderation. And this stuff is cyclical. Facebook was an absolute juggernaut just a couple of years ago, you know, and they have had declining or at least stagnant use usage. Um, they are certainly seen as lame by younger people. It's a place where grandmas and moms sit there and argue over who posts what on the news station, you know, article of the day, um, and post pictures of their cats and whatever. Like it, it has a very dim perception and literally they've bet the company that, you know, that's not a sustainable business or going to be a dying business and they need to pivot to the next thing. Like, a company that went from unassailable to in a very tenuous position in a short period of time, like not that Facebook's going to go out of business, but you know what I mean? Like MySpace was also huge as well. So, you know, TikTok being the new thing, like, I don't know. I'm just like, if, if you're, if you're a staunch capitalist and, and you're, you're upset that somebody else like had a better idea then build, build a better one. Um, unless they're being monopolistic, you know, but now I'm getting way off the beaten path of the content, the, the subject of moderation, but in general, I support moderation just because common sense moderation, I don't think is harmful. Um, and I think it's extremely helpful because I have seen over and over when you try to do wild, wild west, non-moderation, and it, it is never in the history of the internet ended well, like ever. So yeah. I don't expect yeah, that to I, start now. And we get you know, pulled into content moderation quite a bit as InfoSec professionals because we usually operate the tools that enforce the content moderation. So sometimes we get tagged to pick what to moderate when in reality, I think that should more fall on senior leadership or HR even to tell us what they think is their stance on content moderation for like a company. I'm just talking from an enterprise standpoint, whereas, you know, maybe we can say we'll block all the bad things from like malware or phishing and all that. But you want to talk about like content of like, do you want them going to gambling sites or do you want them going to social media sites or whatever, you know, like that is definitely more of a company call versus like an info set call. So f let's talk about what happened at the end here. Because I'm sure you guys want to know if you if you haven't read it. <laughs> on September 3rd, Sorrenti's partner was streaming on Twitch. And she told her chat that she was planning on taking Sorrenti to a poutine shop in Belfast. So she can see how Irish poutine holds up. Kiwi Farm users mapped out every poutine shop in the city. And then a user posted that they had a couple of lads down in Belfast with bombs at all of those places along with three armed men on the Kiwi farms forums. So as soon as that went up and Cloudflare was aware of it, 
they kind of changed their tune and they immediately blocked Kiwi Farms. And so they posted another blog post on the third and said, we have blocked Kiwi Farms. Visitors to any of Kiwi Farms sites that use Cloudflare services will see a blocked page. Kiwi Farms and move their sites to other providers if they want to and come back online, but we have taken steps to block their content from being accessed through our infrastructure. They also said, this is an extraordinary decision for us to make and given Cloudflare's role as an internet infrastructure provider, a dangerous one that we are not comfortable with. However, the rhetoric on Kiwi Farm site and specific targeted threats have escalated over the last 48 hours to the point that we believe there is an unprecedented emergency and immediate threat to human life, unlike we have previously seen from Kiwi Farms or any other customers. Yeah, I kind of eye roll at that as well. You, you, <laughs> you see I me saw you eyes? do that. <laughs> yes, but that's literally how I took it as well. Like I read that and I was just like, give me a break. And then it's also worth noting that if you follow their stock, their stock was like dropping this whole time that this was being reported on, basically like about August 15th to around September 3rd. It was just their, their stock dropped by about 15%. And, you know, just personally, I, I, when I read this, I think it just sounds like, hey, we really, really, really don't want to do this, but I guess we should because if something happens, we might be complicit in that or we might be blamed for it. And they also specifically wrote in the blog post that they didn't drop Kiwi Farm because of the pressure campaign. Sure, they didn't. <laughs> exactly. No pressure from the shareholders, no pressure from the board, right, Mr. CEO? So, I, you know, I, I, uh, I have a lot of thoughts, but I'll, I'll try to keep it short. It's just, for me, I, I have a pretty strict stance on some of these things. And... While I have used Cloudflare in the past, you know, this is a pattern, right, that I see in this company as long as probably this senior leadership is in place that I really can't support this company. And I know there's a lot of good people who work there, so certainly not blaming any of the people who work there, but this is certainly on senior leadership there. And if it was me, I wouldn't be giving Cloudflare any money at least right now, um, if I was working at a company and they're looking for a CDN or they're looking for security services just based on principle, you know, not because they're not good because they are, they are one of the best in, in DDoS protection. And they also provide a lot of good security services. They're a great CDN provider, but you know, just based on principle of what they, and not to say that they're, I don't think that they're necessarily taking a wrong stance, but they're not making the best decisions. And I think they got this one wrong, in my opinion. So in principle, I can agree with the basic stance that they have, that they want to try to remain neutral. They don't want to moderate. But as Adam, you said that never ends well when there's zero moderation. There has to be some basis. And, you know, they, they really refused to do that until it was, like, too late. And, yeah, so that's, that's my thoughts on that. First, just just a quick correction. I, I noticed, since we were talking about Belfast, I scrolled up, and in the notes we had it written as Belfast, Ireland. Should clarify that Belfast is part of Northern Ireland, which, while they're on the same island... Um, Northern Ireland is part of the United Kingdom. Um, it is not part of the Republic of Ireland, which is the other country on that island. And traditionally, um, in the past, there had actually been a lot of violence and actually bombings um, in Belfast between um, Irish and, and Northern Ireland um, backers of each. And actually, it was Protestants and Catholics and, and all sorts of horrible history there. So um, just wanted to make sure we, we had a correction before we ended the show. Belfast is part of Northern Ireland, which is part of the United Kingdom, and, and we regret the error there, um, just because we know that's actually uh, kind of a sensitive geopolitical topic. Um, that said, really disappointed by, even though they did the right thing, how much they doubled down on like not wanting to do it. And And I agree. And that's why I used that analogy earlier of like the first time I discovered like, 
you mean Google isn't always looking out for Adam and my best interests? You know, Google's looking out for Google's best interests. Like, I'm really disappointed here because again, Cloudflare was another one of those companies that I thought just had this sterling reputation. Again, as Andy mentioned, from a technical stack perspective, as sound as any provider in in the game. You know, they do a really nice job. But I'm disappointed with this and and I don't buy kind of the we're just a dumb pipe letting stuff pass through so we let anybody use it kind of thing. They're a paid service. They establish a relationship with an organization or a person, and there is a business transaction occurring. That is very, very different than like being a T-Mobile or being a Comcast and literally operating a dumb pipe that stuff flows through that you neither inspect nor moderate nor care about. Cellular providers, internet service providers, those are truly dumb pipes, and there is no expectation of moderation, nor should there be. But Cloudflare establishes a relationship with where are you based, how much are you going to pay us, how are you going to pay us, you know, what do you do? Like that, you can't just throw up your hands and be like, we don't know anything, we don't know what's going on. Like, yes, you you have all sorts of information. You have a customer relationship here, so that's where I really don't buy this either. And I get like moderation in general is such a political topic today, but I think there are still a political lines that we can all agree should not be crossed. And given again, I compared the story that Andy told that really happened in real life to a Hollywood thriller slash drama from 27 years ago about the potential horrors of the information superhighway is, you know, they used to call it at the time, like that's real now. And, and these guys are complicit with it. I, I, I don't agree with this, even though they did the right thing. And I applaud them a little bit for that. I think most people seeing this would be like, we need to not back these guys. And again, just to point out, just to point out this too, just because Cloudflare drops them as a customer doesn't mean they can't get DDoS protection from somewhere else, nor does it mean they are wiped from the internet and they're not accessible. Just like if Apple drops your app from the app store, that doesn't mean you're erased from the internet. You can still publish a website. Safari still ships on every iPhone. You are still there and still accessible. Apple can't erase you from the internet. Just like Cloudflare can't erase you from the internet. They can choose that they don't want their name associated with you. Just like Apple chooses all the time. We don't want this associated with us in the app store. It doesn't mean you can't get to it on an iPhone. And so there is no, this is not censorship here. This is not silencing a voice here. This is saying I, as a business owner, don't want to do business with you. And that happens all the time for any reason. I mean, again, if you kind of respect capitalism, you should respect the absolute right of a business owner to deny service to anyone for any reason, you know, outside of people who are in a protected class, of course. Um, and, and I, I just don't see this as anything bigger than that. So, I mean, it's one of those semi-intellectual, semi-principled stances that like we're protecting freedom of speech, you know, just because we find their behavior absolutely unacceptable doesn't mean we're not going to want to take their money. Like if you just want to be naked capitalists, say it, but I don't know. I think that's bad for business and so does wall street. Yeah. And Kiwi farms did find a home with the provider who actually provides services to the daily stormer and a which was formerly a Chan um, after their bans from Cloudflare. So it was purged from the internet archives. It's harder to get to. It probably won't, be as stable and certainly the content is not going to be as fast, but like you said, Adam, it's not going to disappear. You'll still be able to host a website. You can still publish content. It's just, yeah, I find that analogy, you know, interesting when, when you say that, you know, they're just not doing business with these guys anymore. Right. And any business owner can choose not to do business. It's, it's almost like, I think it's very timely when we talk about like, say the pandemic, when people were wearing masks and you had to wear a mask to go into a store to do business, no mask, no, no business. Right. Um, 
no one complained about that before the pandemic when it was you'd see those signs that said no shoes, no shirt, no service. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can not wear shoes. You can be against shoes. But if you try to walk into this business with no shoes on, they're not going to give you any service. It's their right to do that, right? You could be against shirts. I don't like shirts. I never wear a shirt, <laughs> right? But if I go to this store and they're like, put on a shirt or we're not going to serve you, I mean, okay. I mean, that's how it works, right? And so you can publish really bad content. Um, do it all you want. There's technical means of publishing your content, but doesn't mean that you know a web hosting provider has to host that content. It certainly doesn't mean that a CDN has to you know make it better and faster for you. So, um, yeah, it, they did the bare minimum here, and I, I mean, I certainly am eyes wide open now and a little bit more aware of you know, Cloudflare as a business and what they prioritize, I guess. Um, and so for me, I, I'm going to pay him a little bit more attention. You know, Agree. And, and I think it's just a good reminder for any time there's kind of a, a beloved internet company that appears to do no wrong, you know, and just give you total kind of side example. Um, I'm a big Apple fan. I have a lot of Apple stuff and I genuinely enjoy their products. Pre-ordered a new iPhone 14 because I'm a degenerate and I've owned every iPhone ever. Um, I have a really hard time with these like new style Apple pre-recorded, pre-edited, like super slick Apple park porn videos. Like I was fine with people getting up on stage and a bunch of a fr- bunch of fanboys hooting and hollering and showing off the new iPhone every year. And, and a lot of Apple executives, like they do a good job of coming off as, is pretty relatable. Like cred fig- Federighi is like the, the geeks geek. I mean, the guy is great, knows his code, knows his stuff. Phil Schiller seems like a guy you'd love to crush some beers with. Like they seem like relatable guys. And so getting up on stage and talking about, you know, new cameras and new CPUs, like that was fine. Like I was okay with it because it's a presentation. It's meant to be educational, but now it's like this super slickly produced and edited and like design it's, it's an infomercial. And like, it's, it's really turns me off. Like, again, I still bought a new iPhone. Don't get me wrong, but like it, it's opened my eyes in a way to like, this, you know, I mean, Apple exists to sell you a new iPhone every year. That's, that is their goal. And that's fine. That's great. Yay. Capitalism. But sometimes you do get your eyes open to like companies can have this like cuddly and, and really positive image, you know, that's crafted perfectly by PR and marketing. And then it can, you know, things can damage that and make you kind of open your eyes and go again, you know, like they're looking out for their own self-interest here. Um, and that, that is, that is eye opening for sure. And that's our show for this week. Thanks for watching and listening as always. Our contact information will be in the show notes. If you guys have any questions or topics you want us to talk about on future shows. Thanks. We'll talk to you guys next week. Thank you for listening to the Blue Security Podcast. Please check out the show notes, catch up on episodes you may have missed, and subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Find Andy on Twitter at AJawZero and Adam at AJ Brewer. See you at our next episode.